grace and peace to you from God. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may truly love you and worthily praise your holy name through our Savior, Jesus Christ. The hymn of praise is located on just one string over here. So if you guys need to move this way, <laughs> this side doesn't have to say it. <laughs> my soul does magnify God and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior. For God has regarded the lowliness of God's handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. For God, who is mighty, has magnified me, and holy is God's name, and God's mercy is on them who fear God throughout all generations. God has showed strength with God's arm. God has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. God has put down the mighty from their seat and has exalted the humble and meek. God has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich God has sent empty away. Hear the teaching of Christ. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Beloved, hear God's comforting word. God so loved the world that God gave God's only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every kind of wrong. Jesus said, there is joy among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Beloved, God has promised forgiveness to all who truly repent, turn to Christ in faith, and are themselves forgiving. In silence, we call to mind our own sins. Let us confess our sins. Merciful God, we have sinned in what we have thought and said, in the wrong we have done, and in the good we have not done. We have sinned in ignorance. We have sinned in weakness. We have sinned through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry. We repent and turn to you. Forgive us for our Savior Christ's sake and renew our lives to the glory of your name. Amen. Through the cross of Christ, God have mercy on you, pardon you, and set you free. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. God strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. The peace of Christ rule in our hearts. O oh God, whose blessed Son came into the world that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us children of God and heirs of eternal life, grant that having this hope, we may purify ourselves as he is pure, that when he comes again with power and great glory, we may be made like him in his eternal and glorious kingdom, where he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Please be seated and prepare for the readings.
first reading is from the book of Joshua. Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and summoned the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. Now, therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our ancestors up from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and who did these great signs in our sight. He protected us all along the way that we went, and among all the peoples through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Joshua said to the people, you cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Then Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. He said, then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, the Lord our God we will serve and him we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and made statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Psalm 78, we will read responsibly by the half verse. Hear my teaching, O my people. I will open my mouth in a parable. That which we have heard and known and what our forefathers have told us. We will recount to generations to come the praiseworthy deeds and the power of God. Abba God gave decrees to Jacob and established a law for Israel that the generations to come might know and the children yet unborn so that they might put their trust in God. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, 
will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with the cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Please pray with me. God gave God's decrees to Jacob and established a law for Israel and commanded them to teach their children so that they might put trust in God and not forget the deeds of God, but keep Abba God's commandments. Amen. Please be seated. Not a good text in the lot. All of them are harsh. And in fact, on my social media platform, I saw some poor soul strapped with a first event of preaching, say, why, Lord, why? (laughs) I don't like these texts, and I have ample amount of experience 
preaching. None of them are easy. These are all hard lessons, but don't fear the hard lessons. Okay, they're good for you. Like broccoli, if you don't like broccoli. I love all the vegetables. I can't ever find one that's like, ooh. If you've been around, then you've probably heard the phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It's a great colloquialism, right? One bringing comfort to those who may feel they themselves are actually unlovely. Yet as great and comforting as it could be, the phrase is often shrugged off. Yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. I know, you have to say that. You're my mom, right? Much like a teen giving a hard eye roll when you once again tell them they are so handsome and beautiful, right? Yeah, 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 whatever. We dismiss it. Why don't we believe this to be true? But it is actually true. Because the world and our society tell us differently. We're regularly bombarded with images and messages, implicit and explicit, telling us we don't measure up. In this war between us and a myriad of industries, our bodies are the battleground, and all too often, we are ready to let our psyches and our souls be dragged off as prisoners of war. So we don't believe that beauty can actually be in the eye of the one who deems us beautiful because we don't deem ourselves beautiful, wonderful, fleshy miracles, daily breaking boundaries of possible and impossible. Our attention is drawn away toward that which brings death and destruction and not on that which brings life. We focus on the death and destruction, the not measuring up, the always falling short, never on we are actually good enough. We are beautiful. We are fearlessly and wonderfully made. And that no matter where you find yourself on that journey from point A to point B, we talked about last Sunday. No matter young or old, we all carry these burdens of somehow we are falling short and we focus on that. Immersed in this diverted attention, we spend our entire lives focusing on how we fall short, forgetting to live liberated and loved, finding ourselves out of oil and out of time, locked out of the feasts and festivals of life, of living. Now, says Jesus to the crowd, while the foolish bridesmaids were away purchasing olive oil, the bridegroom went to the wedding feast and the prepared bridesmaids entered with him and the door was shut. Now later the remaining bridesmaids came and were saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But the bridegroom answered and said, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. And then Jesus said, therefore you watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Okay, your oppressive silence is fitting. Matthew drops us deep into Palestinian culture as well as drops on us a bomb of eschatological judgment. Oh, damn, the door was shut and didn't open again. None of that's easy. Jesus' parable of what the kingdom of heaven is, a closed door, great, wonderful, tons of comfort there, is actually drawn from wedding customs in first century Palestine where bridesmaids would usher the bridegroom to the house of the bride, and then both of them would be paraded to the wedding venue for the ceremony and the subsequent feasts. Okay? This isn't a made-up thing. It's an actual event that the crowd would have been like, oh, yes, I have seen such doings and goings on. Okay? But the hard part, the eschatological bomb, isn't Jesus' recourse to historic Palestinian wedding customs. This makes sense, okay? 
That makes sense. What's hard is that the bridesmaids are divided into practically wise and foolish. Separating the main characters of a story into two different groups is a well-used ancient literary device used to demand attention and cause inner and outer disruption as the one who hears listens. For one group, it never goes well. And in fact, guess what other story shows up in Matthew 25? My other favorite, the sheep and the goat. Oh, yay. More separation into two groups. Fabulous. Also, previously in Matthew, the separation of the man who builds his house on the solid foundation and the one who builds it on the sand. Okay? Listen up. When you hear two distinct groups becoming the main characters, pay attention. You don't want to be in one of those groups, in other words. After telling the audience that there are two groups of bridesmaids, one foolish, one practically wise, Jesus explains that these ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to wait for the bridegroom. They all went with their lamps. Oh, by the way, the... I don't know if you ever imagine that maybe the lamp looks something like this, like you're carrying it like this, like it's huge and it lights the way. It's a tiny little, tiny little lamp. These are smaller, handheld, okay? (laughs) I saw one. I was like, no way! (laughs) Because I always imagine this big, sturdy flame, right? But it's actually, they're a little bit more capable of being held just by the hands and you know, but they're the candle. A candle will light the darkness for miles, right? Okay, so all ten do the same thing, but five did not bring any more oil than what they carried in their lamps. Okay, then Jesus says, all of the bridesmaids fall asleep for the bridegroom was delayed in coming. Again, all ten go. All ten are like, where is the dude? Get sleepy. All ten go to sleep. All ten go to sleep. I'm emphasizing this because too many bad sermons are preached on the fact that five of them fell asleep. All ten, the wise and the prepared, fell asleep. Okay? Then, Jesus says, Now, in the middle of the night, in the middle of the night, an outcry happened. Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. All ten, wake up. All ten, grab their lamps. Okay? But five wake into lamps that have this tiny wick and little bit of oil, and it's about to go out. Oh, oh darn. Uh Uh-oh. Five of them wake up, lamp, oil, huzzah. We can refill our lamps, okay? Five came prepared. Five, the five lacking oil panic and request help from the five who were prepared. But to no avail, the prepared five bridesmaids send the five lacking oil to the market. Sorry, sisters. The amount of oil we have will not cover Both of us. Okay? Go to the one selling so you might purchase oil for yourself. Now, as the unprepared bridesmaids are off bartering for oil, the bridegroom comes and the festivities commence. The door is shut and it won't open again, not even for the five remaining bridesmaids. They are left out in the cold. Now you're expecting me to make some sort of application where I go about shaming the five foolish bridesmaids for their ridiculous behavior. I will not do such a thing because I know you're not actually expecting that from me. Okay. Whether or not the prepared bridesmaids shared is not the point of the parable. It's actually a sensible thing that the practically wise, that's how the Greek kind of translates, the practically wise ones, they, when they refused to share, they weren't being mean. They were being practical. What happens if they share their oil? 
all 10 lights are going to be out quicker than five lights remaining lit for the bridegroom. Okay? So this isn't about some being mean and some being, you know, silly. I saw some commentaries that referred to the foolish bridesmaids as silly, and that bothered me because of too much history that has been done to women being called silly. Okay? So unprepared, prepared. The prepared ones didn't share, but that's not the point. Okay? It's not about making a moral of the story. It's not about you keeping yours and not giving to others. That's not what Jesus is getting at here. Okay? This parable isn't even about staying awake, and there are plenty of sermons where the emphasis becomes stay awake, don't sleep, because what I need to emphasize is back to my previous emphasis on the fact that all ten fell asleep. Okay? All ten fell asleep. Keeping in mind that all ten bridesmaids fell asleep and all ten woke up at the same time, the point is this. Preparedness stems from love. Okay? This is where I'm taking it. Preparedness stems from love. The emphasis falls on the practically wise bridesmaids being prepared and wise, carrying expectant hope of the bridegroom's arrival at any hour. Thus, the extra olive oil. This isn't the type of cramming and rushing at the last minute. But because of their love, the practically wise bridesmaids brought extra so they would be ready if the bridegroom happened to be delayed beyond expected arrival. You can't manufacture that type of love at the last minute. It's there and it is working behind the scenes, making the object of love, the beloved, beholden by the eye, the beautiful one, the one longed for and desired way before the actual event. The preparedness of love in this story redefines family because of the fixed mutual gaze of the beloved and the lover. Are you tracking with that? Okay. Preparedness is a way of saying, I love you. I love you enough to think in advance of something that could happen that could hinder my presence to be with you. How many TV shows depict the scenes, by the way, the answer is so many, where someone has written their vows and someone else hasn't, and the tension that thus therein, therein ensues? Because what does the person who's prepared feel like the other person is communicating who hasn't written their vows yet? It feels like they're communicating a lack of desire, right? Okay? Preparedness says this event is so important, I'm going to spend a week before preparing for it. Okay? I'm not by any means shaming anyone who finds themselves in procrastination mode. Oh, heck, I am there often. I was late coming to church, and I was here at 8.30, okay? I was late getting up here, all right? But there is a point in time where you know that there's this great big event coming that it's so important that you start making these plans and these motions way ahead of time so that when this event happens, it's not chaotic, it's comfortable, and it's peaceful, and it's smooth, okay? This is about mutual fixed gaze of love. This isn't about staying awake. This isn't about shaming people. This isn't about sharing. The story is about love prepares for the arrival of the beloved. Looking out like the father of the prodigal son, standing, watching. Like wives going around the turret, looking for her husbands to return home from long sails. Love looks. Love longs for, love prepares. Does that make sense? In light of that, the eschatological judgment, the door closing, this isn't about shame and condemnation. This is an exhortation towards preparedness. And Jesus ends by saying, keep all that oil. You don't know the day or the hour. Come prepared. 
and sleep well being prepared. Okay? So conclusion, what are we going to do with this? And how did this at all relate to the introduction? Because those feel like two different things. Jesus' use of this parable is to speak to those who are listening and to refocus their gaze on the true bridegroom himself. Okay? Jesus is eager to draw God's beloved unto himself, thus unto God, to bring them deep into life, into love, into liberation, to enter with them into the great wedding feast, to be celebrated and rejoiced. That's what Jesus wants you to walk away from. Focused on him, wrapped up in the love of God, daring to believe it, and hopeful to enter the great wedding feast. This is a good parable. It is hard, but it is good. So is God jealous? Our First Testament passage referenced God being jealous. And I need to tell you, God is. But not jealous over anything but you. Jealous for you. For you to know the depth of how much God loves you. Jealous for those outside of this building to know they are so loved by God. So loved that God will move heaven and earth to be born in Christ in the lap of Mary to ride it across the starry night sky. So desired, you are so desired, everyone is so desired. God will reorder life and death and the resurrection of Christ from the dead to shout it to the ends of the cosmos. So cherished, God by God's spirit will, will draw intimately near to the beloved, transcending God's self to show that such meager jars of clay are marvelously and wonderfully made. Beautiful, beloved. And all of it to draw the focus away from death, destruction, and toward life, love, and liberation. Away from all of the myths and narratives telling the beloved they are inferior and don't measure up or need to be this or that or must deny their own selves to be loved. God draws this attention, your attention, the beloved's attention, away from that toward true, unyielding, always and forever, never stopping, never giving up divine love for you, just as you are. Beloved, dare to believe God loves you so much and that you know you are the apple of God's eye. The most beautiful and wonderful thing God's ever seen. Each of you, all of you together, Turn your heads to the still, small voice, calling your name, reminding you how precious you are. Turn your head away from death and destruction, about trying to measure up to some mythical proportion of what it means to be beautiful or human or right or whatever. Turn your head away from that and turn toward, dare to believe this radical message of God's love for you, where you are, as you are. And not just dare to believe it, double down. Double down so much that you bring that extra oil with you and are ready for when the bridegroom comes. Those who have ears, Next is the creed. In whatever posture you find most comfortable, please say it with me if you feel so called to do so. We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all life, of sun and moon, of water and earth, of all living things. We believe in God beside us, Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, born of a woman, servant of the poor, tortured and nailed to a tree, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, he died forsaken. He descended into the earth to the place of death. On the third day, he rose from the tomb. He ascended into heaven to be everywhere present and his kingdom will come on earth. We believe in God within us, 
the Holy Spirit burning with Pentecostal fire, life-giving breath of the church, spirit of healing and forgiveness, source of resurrection and of eternal life. Amen. Next is the prayers of the people. Again, please join in with us if you feel so called from whatever posture you find most comfortable. Heavenly God, you have promised to hear when we pray in the name of Christ. Therefore, in confidence and trust, we pray for the church. God, enliven the church for its mission. We may be salt of the earth and light to the world. Breathe fresh life into your people. Give us power to reveal Christ in word and action. We pray for the world, creator of all. Lead us and every us and every people into the ways of justice and peace. That we may respect one another in freedom and truth. Awaken in us a sense of wonder for the earth and all that is in it. Teach us to care creatively for its resources. We pray for the community, God of truth. Inspire with your wisdom those whose decisions affect the lives of others that all may act with integrity and courage. Give grace to all whose lives are linked with ours. We pray for those in need, God of hope. Comfort and restore all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. May they know the power of your healing love. Make us willing agents of your compassion. Strengthen us as we share in making people whole. We remember those who have died in the faith of Christ, especially Debbie Rikowski, and those whose faith is known to you alone. God, into your hands we commend them. Give comfort to those who mourn. Bring them peace in their time of loss. We praise you for all your saints who have entered into your glory. May their May example, example inspire, inspire and encourage us. We pray for ourselves and our ministries. Lord, you have called us to serve you. Grant that we may walk in your presence, your love in our hearts, your truth in our minds, your strength in our wills, until at the end of our journey, we know the joy of our homecoming and the welcome of your embrace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. amen. God of mercy, you have given us grace to pray with one heart and one voice and have promised to hear the prayers of two or three who agree in your name. Fulfill now, we pray, the prayers and longings of your people as may be best for us and for your kingdom. Grant us in this world to know your truth and in the world to come to see your glory. The peace of Christ be always with you. Also. Greet each other in acceptable forms of peace. And then you can be seated, and then I'll ask if there's any, anyone that is um, traveling or celebrating a birthday or an anniversary. <laughs> I hope you weren't expecting to not be pointed at. <laughs> All right, so being a liturgical tradition that likes to have everything in the grasp of our hands, please grasp the Book of Common Prayer. And we will be praying for Elita from page 830. Do you have a preference on which one? We'll do um, number 51 for a birthday. And she, her, can take that. Are you okay if you put my hand on your shoulder? Okay, and we'll do this together. Watch over thy child, O Lord, as her days increase. 
Bless and guide her wherever she may be. Strengthen her when she stands. Comfort her when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise her up if she fall. And in her heart may thy peace, which passeth understanding, abide all the days of her life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Bless us. Anyone else? Phyllis, are you coming up for a blessing? Okay, that way. <laughs> Taking a right, not a left. Okay, Whew, off the hook. <laughs> All right, with that said, let us continue over here on this screen. Beloved, we are the body of Christ. Keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Let us with gladness present the offering and oblations of our life and labor to the Lord.
the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. This is God's table for God's people. Everyone who feels called to come forward is not only invited, but deeply encouraged to do so. God is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to our God. It is right indeed. It is our joy and our salvation. Holy Lord, almighty creator, everlasting God, at all times and in all places, to give you thanks and praise you through Christ, your only Son. You are the source of all life and goodness. Through your eternal word, you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. When we sinned and turned away, you called us back to yourself and gave your son to share our human nature. By his death on the cross, he made the one perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world and freed us from the bondage of sin. You raised him to life triumphant over death. You exalted him in glory. In him, you have made us a holy people by sending upon us your holy and life-giving spirit. Therefore, with the faithful who rest in him, especially Debbie Rickenbach, with the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. glory and thanksgiving to you, holy God. On the night before he died, your son, Jesus Christ, took bread. When he had given you thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. When he had given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Your death we show forth. Your resurrection we proclaim. Your coming we await. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Therefore, loving God, recalling your great goodness to us in Christ, his suffering and death, his resurrection and ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate our redemption with this bread of life and this cup of salvation. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, which we offer through Christ, our great high priest. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine which we receive may be to us the body and blood of Christ. And that we, 
filled with the Spirit's grace and power, may be renewed for the service of your kingdom. United in Christ with all who stand before you in heaven and earth, we worship you, O God, in songs of everlasting praise. As Christ teaches us, we pray. Our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Let us pray. Most merciful God, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean. Our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you are the God of our salvation and share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your son that he may live in us and we in him, and that we with the whole company of Christ may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen. Ta hagia tois hagios, holy gifts for holy people. Draw near and receive the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ in remembrance that he died for us. Let us feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. God of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the spirit lights give light to the world. God bless you and keep you. God, make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. God, lift up God's countenance upon you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the creator, the reconciler, and the redeemer be among you and remain with you always. As those who have been encountered by God in the event of faith and the proclamation of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, go, go forth into the world, carrying and sharing the grace and mercy of God, bringing God's love to all. Alleluia, alleluia.